you a warm welcome to be with us this evening to hear our Bible based address to the title. Let us show you that God speaks through his word, the Bible. As an introduction to his remarks, our speaker for this evening has asked that we read from a portion of the New Testament scriptures from 2nd of Peter and chapter 1. That interesting reading, friends introduces us to our Bible-based lecture for this evening to the title, let us, know, let us Show You That God Speaks Through His Word, the Bible. And we'll draw your attention to our speaker for this evening, my friend and brother, Mr Phil Hunter. Well, thank you, Brother Chairman, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And we thank you for coming to hear what we have to say on this topic tonight. Because we believe that it is the Bible is the word of God. And when we read the Bible with understanding, it is as if God is speaking to us. Because he has recorded those words for our learning and our ad admonition. That we may know his purpose with the earth. That we may understand that which he will do upon this earth shortly that we may be assured of those things because we can see what he said would occur on this earth through history, which was predicted before it occurred. And if we're prepared to read this book, this collection of 66 books, we can find all there that we need to live a long and fulfilling life on this earth. If not in this present life, in a life to come, when the Lord Jesus Christ will return to establish the kingdom of God on this earth, to raise the dead who have been faithful or who, have been, who are responsible and glorify the faithful with eternal life on a rejuvenated earth. If we read the scriptures, if we read the Bible, we will see that God speaks to us of many things. His plan and purpose, as we said. He speaks of history but at one stage that was a prophecy and it's the most accurate history book there is. It gives us prophecy and it's the only book that can be relied upon to give a correct prediction of the future, a prediction that will be fulfilled to the letter, that has been fulfilled to the letter where it has, that prophecy has come to pass and where it hasn't we can be sure that it will in God's own time. It's a book that can be used for a manual for life. The words explain how men and women are to live lives that are acceptable to Almighty God. It explains to us the beginning of all things. God speaks to us and tells us how this earth came into being and how life on this earth was created. It speaks of health to us and tells us how we can live healthy and fulfilling lives. It tells us of a successful social security system, one that worked for an entire nation, one I guess that is topical this week in this country when we hear the politicians saying the day of entitlement is over. Let's just have a very quick look at that. Leviticus 19 and verse 10. And it was instructions of God speaking to that nation 
so that nobody there had to go to bed hungry. Leviticus 19 and verse 10. And we read, And thou shalt not glean the vineyard, neither shalt thou gather every grape of thy vineyard. Thou shalt leave them for the poor and stranger. I am the Lord your God. And the same was said for the cornfield when they reaped their grain. They weren't to take the bits out of the corner, but they were to leave it for the poor and the stranger so that the poor could go out and pick those bits up and have food to eat rather than what occurs today where they can sit there and have a handout given to them and it goes from bad to worse. But most importantly, we'll have a look at some other things where the Bible speaks to us as we go through tonight. But most importantly, however, if we're prepared to listen to God through his word, the Bible, it's able to give each of us a hope for what will occur on this earth. You see, it can make us look at what's occurring around us in the world. And rather than looking in despair at what man is doing to man, we can say, God is in control. You see, he tells us the things that will occur so that we can look at those things and say, he is in control. That the, God will send his son back to this earth to establish his kingdom on this earth. If we have a look back at 2nd of Peter that we had read for us, we'll just have a look at a few verses here. Verse 16 of 2nd of Peter chapter 1 we read, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables, when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. You see, the Apostle Paul said to, the, said to Peter when he wrote this letter to him, he said, it's not cunningly devised fables. I think it might have been Peter that wrote this, sorry. It's not cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the things that were written here because they had seen the Lord Jesus Christ. They were eyewitnesses of his majesty. They were sure of the things that were written here. And in verse 19 we read, For we, also, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. He's telling us that in the word of God, the Bible, we have a sure word of prophecy, one that we can look at and have confidence in, one that is as a light that shines in a dark place, that gives light to all who are prepared to listen to the things that are written therein. In 1 of Timothy 2 and verse 4, we have the statement of the Apostle Paul where God through him says, who will have all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. God speaks to us through his word, the Bible, and he has given to us there instructions as to how we may be saved. However, when we look at the end, we see its condition. To be saved, we have to come to a knowledge of the truth. That's conditional on being saved. Yes, there's more to it than that. It's of the truth as God defines it, as God has set out, and as God requires that we should live in our lives. You see, God, through his word, the Bible, explains to us how we should live. He explains what is acceptable in his sight. It's on God's terms that we can be saved, not on man's terms. It's no point us saying, well, I'd like to do it that way, because if it's not as God wants it, there will be no salvation. Back in our reading, I think I've got it on here. In 2 Peter 1 and verse 21, you've probably got that still open. We told that for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. What it's telling us is that what we have recorded in God's word, the Bible, is not words that are man's, but they are God's words and he caused men to, to speak or to write as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. 
So as the Apostle Peter was moved to write this epistle, he started Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle, because he was moved by the Holy Spirit to do that. And as a result of that, though there's 66 books, it is one book, because it has one author from one end to the other. And as it has one author, it has one message. And for us to understand that message, we need to be able to read the scriptures, to piece together the various bits and pieces so that we can understand what God will do and what he will have us to do on this earth. In Amos 3 and verse 7, we have another statement by Almighty God. And he says, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants the prophets. You see, we have here God speaking to those who will listen. He will do nothing unless he reveals it to his servants, the prophets. If we read the scriptures, the word of God, we can have God's plan and purpose with this earth revealed to us. We can also have events that will occur shortly on this earth explained to us if we are prepared to be his servants. You see, by a reading of the Bible, we can understand what God will do on this earth. We can look and see events that occur and say, yes, that's another tick we can put in the box, one step closer to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, let's consider a few other passages of Scripture where God has spoken through his word, the Bible. Let's start with the natural creation around us, with the natural world as we see it everywhere that we look. And when we look at this, we can see God's work in all the earth. In fact, when we look at creation, we are without excuse for believing that there is a God. Because when we look at creation, we see the stamp of a master creator in all that we see. The Apostle Paul in Romans wrote this, and he says, For the invisible things of him which from the creation of the world are clearly seen, the trees, the animals, and so forth that we see, being understand by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. And if we were to read right the way through Romans chapter 1, or this part of it here, we would see that what it's telling us is that when we look at creation, we can look and see what God has created, how he brought the earth together out of the chaos that it was to generate what is there. And we are without excuse for believing there is a God because in everything that is there, the stamp of that master creator is there. The problem is, though, that men look at those things and they turn their back on them. They look at nature and they try to concoct a story to take it away. And scripture tells us that this is exactly what man was going to do. But it tells us also the results of what would happen when this occurred. And we see the proof of this in the world around us. In Romans 1, if you'll turn there please, we have this recorded as to what would occur. In Romans 1, verse, uh, commencing at verse 21, we read, Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into the imi an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonour their own bodies between themselves. You see, they went from the things of God. They went after every imagination of their heart. And God said, if that is what you want, that's what you can have. They changed, in verse 25, they changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. And for this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. Even their own women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. 
And on it goes and shows what man has done when he's turned his back on God. And we see that in the world around us, don't we? Men don't want to know God. I heard it once in the lunchroom. Who is he to tell us how we should live? Well, God gave them to their vile affections. And we have the results, don't we? And as we read through the passage of scripture, we see the outcome for man predicted as he turns from God. He turns from the creator and they don't want to know of him. And today in general, men are like that. They don't want to know it. And the results are exactly as listed in this passage. In verse 29, they're unrighteous. There's fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without uh, understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but he have pleasure in them that do them. And that's, doesn't that sum up the world today in which we live, who's turned their back on God? And what God tells us is that they are worthy of his judgment. They are worthy of death. Why? Because they've turned their back on them. But not only are they, but also those who have pleasure in them that do them. You see, men, rather than listening to the things of Almighty God and taking on the responsibilities this demands, they turn to their own ideology, don't we? And we see what's happened in history when this has happened with the massacres that have occurred at different places. Man wanting to get one over another. And where does it end up? In anything but a good situation. These men are lovers of their own wisdom rather than that of God. You see, if we read the Bible, if we listened to what God told us, we would have understood that these things would happen. Because what does God say of man? He tells us if we're prepared to listen, O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. What do we see in the world? Ten years ago, this nation was in a good position, wasn't it? What's happened? Has man directed his steps? They've told us last week the day of entitlement is over. Why? Because man cannot direct his steps. He's not in control of what's going on. I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man to direct his steps. What we're being told here is that if we are to have our steps directed in a what right way, we are to look to something else. We can't look to Mr Abbott, Mr Obama, Mr Putin, because it's not in them to direct our steps or their steps. You see, the only place we can look is to the Bible, where God speaks to us to explain how we should live. Well, what are the prophecies of the Bible? God speaks to us in prophecies in many places, doesn't he? There's hundreds, probably thousands of prophecies throughout scripture that are recorded for those who are prepared to listen to what God has to say to us. They're recorded in scriptures so that we will know what will come to pass on this earth because the ultimate fulfilment is when the Lord Jesus Christ will be in this earth reigning over the kingdom of God and subduing the earth under him. So that the, at the end of a thousand year period, he may hand that kingdom back to his father with all things, including sin and death, subdued. But you see, when we look at scriptures, when we look at prophecies, they're given there for a reason. They're given there so that we can look and see God speaking to us and understand what he will do. We can look and see what's occurring in the world and say, we don't need to worry about that because God ultimately is in control. Yes, because God's in control doesn't mean 
things that are not nice won't happen. Because God will still leave man to do as he pleases. We have Mr Assad, don't we? He's making a mess of his own country there. God could stop that. But God is letting man try and do his best. And eventually God will intervene. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ gave his disciples a prophecy. And in Luke 21 and verse 28, he said, When these things that I've told you begin to come to pass, look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. And that is the purpose of prophecy, so that we can look at those things and understand what will occur on this earth. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ here spoke of a release or a deliverance from the bondage of sin and death. He spoke of that time, spoken of in Revelation 21, a favourite quote of mine, where we're told that God at that time will wipe away all tears from their eyes. There'll be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. If we're prepared to listen to what God tells us through the Bible, that lot can also be ours. Because ultimately... What God has said he will do with this earth is fill it with his glory. And we're told in Habakkuk that he will fill it with his glory as completely as the waters cover the sea. It doesn't leave room for too much else. You see, God will fill it with those who are prepared to give him glory and honour. Those who through their lifetime have endeavoured to do that which is right and proper in thy sight. Who have endeavoured to give him glory and honour. But you see, we're just not prepared. We're just not required to blindly believe that. To blindly believe that one day the earth will be filled with God's glory. We'll wake up in the morning and we'll be done. No, it won't be like that. God has given through scripture. He tells us exactly what will occur. And in this way, through prophecy, God is telling us how he will shortly bring to pass his purpose with this earth. I want to just have a look at two very brief prophecies, or two prophecies, they're not necessarily brief, but two prophecies very briefly, to see how we can read the Bible and see these things coming to pass before our very eyes, to see the things that God has spoken to us if we're prepared to listen and see that, yes, he is speaking to us today through his word, the Bible. In Zechariah 12 and verse 3, we have a prophecy of Jerusalem. We all know about Jerusalem, don't we? Throughout scripture, it's described as being a city of peace, but in history, it's been anything but. From the earliest time, there's been bloodshed in that that city, and it continues today, don't we? We ask why. When of all cities, men would like to sort that one out. Let's have it as an international city, they say. But the Arabs want it, the Catholics want it, the Russians want it, the Palestinians want it, the Muslims want it, and Israel has title to that today. And they're all prepared to fight for it if necessary. And add to that the United Nations, who will do what they can to try and solve it, We have the US, we have Russia, we have Britain, we have the Vatican, who all throw their 20 cents worth in from time to time to try and do something. And at the other end of it, we have a bigger mess. But what scripture tells us is that all who trouble themselves with this city will end up in trouble. To them, it will be a burden. And it will be a burden that will lead them to the Battle of Armageddon. The prophet Zechariah predicted that this would be the case for Jerusalem. We're told that the city would be a burdensome stone for all who will burden themselves with it. 1967 and 1973, what happened? We had the Six Day War, the Yom Kippur War. The Russians backed the Arabs. America backed Israel, sort of. And the Arabs were beaten. It didn't solve the problem. 
And there's many more occurrences when we could look at that, that uh, what's happened to Jerusalem and see that it's just been an ongoing saga. But when we look in Zechariah 12 and verse 13, we see what God says about that city today. As men go about to do what they try to do there. He says, in that day I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. When we look at the scriptures, when we read passages like that and hear God speaking to us through his word, the Bible, we can look at what Mr Obama is trying to do and see that it will fail. What it will be to him is a burden that will ultimately bring the world to Armageddon. You see, the problem is, it's not in man that walketh to direct his steps. And ultimately, all people will be gathered together against that nation to battle. You see, we could look at this as a test for prophecy and see that the Bible has got it right. And while the events spoken of in this uh, prophecy were recorded many years ago, and before the things we see today occurring, they are accurate to the letter. And that city will go on being a burden. The events that occur there are contrary to what man would want. Man would love to have peace in that city. Well, some, I guess they all would, but on their terms. But it eludes them. You see, we can look at what's going on in the world today. If you've been following it, Mr Obama, um, his Secretary of State, is it? John Kerry. The Palestinian um, president, I forget his name. Um, Mr Netanyahu and many others are involved in discussions to bring peace to the Middle East. And what are they saying? Well. Miss Netanyahu, you take 100,000 people and get rid of them out of that area. We'll divide the land up for, from you. We'll take it off you. We'll give it to the Palestinians and you'll have peace. What does the scripture say about this? Well, have a look in Joel 3, verse 1 to 3. You see, if we're listening to what God is telling us in the scripture, we will look at those things and we will say, it's another step in the direction of the establishment of the kingdom of God on this earth. And we read in Joel 3, For behold, in those days and in that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and, and parted my land. And they have cast lots for my people and given a boyfriend harlot and sold a girl for wine that they might drink. You see, these men propose a solution, but it's not in God's terms. And where this is ultimately going to lead the world is to the battle of Armageddon. Because they have scattered God's people among the nations and parted his land. And when we look at what's going on in the world, in, in that area of land at the moment, those who are doing it don't understand what they're doing. They should watch their step. If they understood the Bible, they would. But what they are doing is leading this world to the battle of Armageddon and ultimately the establishment of the kingdom of God on this earth. Let's have a look at another prophecy, another very small prophecy about the city of Damascus. We read the burden of Damascus. Behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city and is become a ruinous heap. When we look at Damascus, we see a city that I believe or I'm told has 4.8 million people in the greater Damascus area and its suburbs, or it did have. And the claim also is that Damascus is the longest continuously inhabited city on the earth. You know, what scripture tells us is that Damascus will ultimately be taken away from being a city and it will be a ruinous heap. Maybe, just maybe, we're seeing the start of that occurring before our eyes today. Mr Assad, in what he's doing, yes, I think it'll take more than Mr Assad to destroy the city as it's spoken of there. 
But we don't know where these things could lead, though we do know the ultimate outcome of them. You see, once again, the word of God is spoken to us that we may be encouraged and have our faith developed in the things of Almighty God. God gives us a little prophecy here, another one there. And elsewhere he tells us how we should live our lives so as to be obedient to him. And these prophecies aim to increase our faith, to give us faith when we see these things occurring, that yes, God is in control. That yes, God does still speak to us today through his word, the Bible. As I've alluded to, the Bible speaks to us and tells us that there is a hope beyond the present order of things that we see in the world. A hope of being raised from the dead to inherit the kingdom of God on this earth or to be with Christ when he does return if we have been faithful to the calling that God gives us through his word, the Bible. You see, a belief and understanding of what is written in his pages can give us redemption from the certainty of death that awaits each of us if we do not live to see the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth. In 2 Timothy 4, verse 6 to 8, we have the words of the Apostle Paul as he drew near to his death. This man had a faith in what would happen to him after his death. And he says, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all those also that love his appearing. This was the confidence of the Apostle Paul, who listened when God spoke to him. He was confident that he would receive a crown of righteousness at the time when Christ returned. You see, the hope wasn't only for him. The hope is for all those who look and long for his appearing. As we have at the end there. Also that, uh, unto, but unto all them also that love his appearing. You see, the Apostle Paul looked forward to that day when the Lord Jesus Christ would be in the earth again. When he would establish the kingdom of God and when he would reign as king over the entire earth. The hope of the resurrection was the hope he had. He said in one place when he was a prisoner, for the hope of the resurrection I am bound with this chain. Well, what of us? Do we listen to God and do we look at that and have that hope also? The hope of eternal life on this earth. You see, we need to go right back to the beginning of the scripture to understand what this is. Genesis 13 and verse 14 to 17. We have a promise made to a faithful man called Abram, a man who God promised the earth. And he said, And the Lord said unto Abraham, after that lot was separated from him, Lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward and westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. And I'll make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. If we listen to what God is telling us here, we can see many things. Abram was promised the land for eternity. His seed was also promised the land for eternity. The question is, who is that seed? His seed would be great in number. And just in case there was any question as to what was promised, he was told to hop up and walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it and it would give it to him. Abraham longed to receive that promise of the earth, but he died. He bought a piece of land to bury his wife and he was ultimately buried there as well. He didn't receive that promise. If we go to the New Testament, to Galatians 3, 
we can see where this promise is extended. In verse 16 we read of Galatians 3, Now to Abram and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed which is Christ. So when we look back at Genesis 13, we can see it was promised to a seed. And we told there that it was not to seeds as of many, not to many, but one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. So the promised seed of Abraham, or Abram, was the Lord Jesus Christ. But if we go on a little further in Galatians, we can see that that promise is extended to all who will listen to what God speaks through his word, the Bible. In verse 27, we're told, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as being baptised into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And in verse 29, If ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What God is telling us what God is telling every single person who is prepared to read his word, that they can be part also of this promise. That if you go to the land of Israel where Abraham was, or Abram was as he was known then, and look northward, southward, eastward and westward, if you walk through that land, you can be part of the seed that is spoken of up here, if we are Christ's. The hope of the Bible is the resurrection from the dead to inherit the earth forever. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he spoke to the Sadducees in Luke 20, spoke of the resurrection of the dead. The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. The Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection, didn't even believe in angels, if I remember correctly. They were there to get out of it what they could get today, like most people in the world around us. They'll live their years on this earth and die. They'll get out of it what they can, and that will be them. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ, in answer to a question where the Sadducees had come to him to trip him up, he answered and said unto them, The children of the world marry and are given in marriage. But they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. Neither can they die any more, for they are equal unto the angels and are children of God, being the children of the resurrection. Now that the dead are raised, even Moses showed at the bush, when he calleth the Lord, the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. For he is not a God of the dead, but of the living. For all live unto him. When the Lord Jesus Christ spoke these words, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob are in the, were in the grave, were dead, they were buried, even as they remain today. But what the Lord Jesus Christ said is he said, Moses showed when, that he was not the God of the dead, but of the living, when he called God the God of Abraham, of Isaac and of Jacob. What he was showing is that God is going to raise those men from the dead to receive that inheritance. To receive the inheritance on this earth for eternity. And not only them, but all the faithful through time. And all the faithful who will die before the Lord Jesus Christ returns. Let's turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 20 to 28. And we'll have a quick look at the process of this resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 20 to 28. Where we read, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that sleep, slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. 
So what we're being told is that Christ was raised from the dead. He was the first fruits from the dead. And that when Christ returns, those who are Christ will be raised at that time. In verse 24, we're told, Then cometh the end, when she, he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he that is Christ must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifested that he is accepted which did put all things under him. So what we're being shown is that when Christ reigns on the earth, he will put all things under his feet. He will ultimately destroy all opposition to God. He will destroy the last enemy, which is death. But it's accepted that God who put all things under him will not also be put under him. In verse 28, But when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all and in all. And what we have here is a very succinct explanation of the resurrection of the dead and the process that will occur so that the Lord Jesus Christ can subdue all enemies to Christ, to God, sorry. So that all the enemies can be destroyed. So that sin and death can be done away. So that those words we read in Revelation can be a reality. When sorrow and suffering will be done, done away. Well, who then will be Christ at his coming? Let's consider Mark 16, verse 15 to 16, a passage we probably all know very well. It was a commandment of the Lord Jesus Christ to his disciples. And he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptised shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be condemned. What the Lord Jesus Christ told his disciples to do was to preach the gospel to those who would listen. And from them there would basically be two classes. Those who believed and were baptised, who would ultimately be saved, provided they continued in that belief. And those who would not believe, who would ultimately be condemned, who would return to the grave for eternity, never to see the light of day again. Let's turn back to our reading tonight in 1st of Peter chapter 1 and verses 19 to 20. And we read there, as we read before, 1st of Peter 1 verses 19 to uh, 21. Sorry, it wasn't our reading, it was 2nd Peter, wasn't it? But... Sorry, it should be 2nd of Peter 1. Okay. Where we read, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto we do well that ye take heed, unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. What we have here is a challenge for every one of us. We're told that the prophecy or the words of the Bible are not of any private interpretation. Everybody can understand them if they're prepared to put time in to listen to what God tells us through his word. It's not something that came by the will of man. It's like a light that shines in a dark place. It shines forth and gives light to those who will hear. In the Psalms it's spoken of as being a light unto our feet and a lamp unto our path. It's spoken of as being that which can guide us in, the, in our lives today, in those ways that are acceptable unto Almighty God. It's full of very plain prophecies, 
things that every one of us can understand. And it's a word that you and I would do well to take heed of. You see, the challenge for every one of us is to go home, to search the scriptures, to confirm what is in there. Because it's not of private interpretation. Because if we are to be saved, we need to believe. If we are to believe, we need to understand. And if we are to understand, we need to read. We need to read and listen to what God is telling us through his word of truth, the Bible. If we're not prepared to do that, the words at the end there are for us. We will be condemned rather than saved. Ladies and gentlemen, we urge you to look at the things of the scripture, to understand them, to understand those things that are written therein for your own benefit. Because in them and them them alone are the words of God which he speaks to us that we may have life when his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, returns to this earth. We thank you for your time.